Again, good morning and God bless you. Uh, turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 13. We've been going through this series about how does God save a nation. And the recognition is that all nations will stand before Jesus. And all nations will experience the correction of the Lord and the judgment of the Lord. And there is a separation that takes place between as, as sheep and goats are separated. And the United States, like every nation of the earth, gives an accounting to Jesus Christ. And so we say, well, why, why are we not worried about all the nations of the earth? We certainly are. Jesus told us to go into all the world. But he also gave a specific instruction that the believers within a nation are responsible for that nation. God called us to be salt and light. He did not call Joe Biden to be salt and light. He did not call the Supreme Court to be salt and light. He did not call the Congress to be salt and light. They have a role and an accountability before God. Don't get me wrong. But the Lord is dealing with his church today. He is dealing with his people right now. Because Jesus said in John 18 that his kingdom is not of this world. And so there is a reality that while we are in the world, we are not of the world. Wherever we are planted, Acts 17, 26, we are planted because God in his purpose and intention placed us here. God chose that you would live here, whether, whether by citizenry or by residence. God chose that you would live here in this hour, in this time, and he gave you responsibilities to worship him, but also to be an influencer. Remember in the first part of the year when we talked about the role of the church, the ecclesia, and that of, of bringing influence into culture and change. And so we're in a position now in the United States <clears throat> where we cannot see because we will not see. We cannot hear because we will not hear. And so we're falling under the consequences of our choices. That's what judgment looks like. It is when you fall under the consequences of your own choices. And so Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, our text for this summer, beginning in the 12th verse, whoever has spiritual wisdom because he is receptive to God's word, everybody say receptive, receptive. to him more will be given. He'll be richly and abundantly supplied. But whoever does not have spiritual wisdom because he has devalued, everybody say devalued, devalued, devalued God's word, even what he has will be taken away from him. If there's ever a verse that gives you an understanding to the times, that should be it. The remnant that God is raising up is a group of people who value his word. And the falling of a nation is because the nation has devalued his word. And it doesn't get better on its own. There has to be a change. Verse 13. This is the reason I speak to the crowds in parables, because while having the power of seeing, they do not see, and while having the power of hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand and grasp spiritual things. In other words, they had the capacity, but chose not. Verse 15. For this nation's heart has grown hard. Say that with me. This nation's heart has grown hard. With their eyes they hardly, or with their ears they hardly hear, and they have tightly closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. We are filled with expectation about what you want to do today. We invite you to have your way in this service. We pray that your word would go forward with power and anointing and that we would all have ears to hear, myself included, maybe even myself especially. Ears to hear what your spirit is saying to your people. For you are the shepherd. We are the sheep. We ask in Jesus' name that your mighty Holy Ghost would also move in our midst and that you would set people free. And that you would bring healing, bring deliverance, bring wholeness, bring life, bring freedom. 
to the body of Christ. And for these things we say thank you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And all who are in agreement said together, Amen. Amen. How does our Lord save a nation? The wonderful thing is that God wants to. He wants to. He's not given up on our nation. He's not given up on our state. He's not given up on our city. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that God has redemptive purpose in everything? And that no matter how corrupt or how vile, how wicked or how lost a nation or a team or, or rather a, a nation or a tribe or language group, a people group, a city, a state, no matter how far off we go, God still pursues us with grace and mercy. And so all remedy is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've talked about this. What does the Lord do? He raises up a remnant. Everybody say remnant. remnant. <clears throat> the remnant are those people that want nothing more than the will of God. And they will accept nothing less than the glory of God. They want the will and the glory of God to be done in their own lives. They want the will and the glory of God to be done in their families, in their churches, in their communities, and yes, in their nations. We call upon the Lord, we ask the Lord to raise up his people in the earth. He does not need a majority, he and he doesn't need a silent majority. Did you get that? He needs a people who are as committed to him as he is to them even though that's not actually possible. He's looking for a people who will love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their mind, with all their soul, and yes, with all their strength. That they will fiercely pursue him. He's looking for a missional church who understands the spiritual life cycle of a nation and the pattern of opposition that the enemy does. He is looking for a people who will wage war against the dominion of darkness by ministering in the opposite spirit of the age. He is looking for a people who will speak life to death. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. What a silly foolish prayer if you haven't the power behind it. Lazarus, come forth. Similar to what the Lord said to Ezekiel, can these bones live? You know. Prophesy. Speak life to death, dying, decaying, going away. I can do more than you can imagine. He's looking for a people who are just crazy enough to believe the book. Without explaining it away, without throwing it aside, Men and women who will say, I believe that what God said is the truth and I will pursue and follow his truth with all my heart, mind, soul, and yes again, strength. Every fiber of my being. This is what revival looks like. He forms a remnant and then he revives them. He's reviving the church right now. We see the seeds of revival. We see the blades of grass of revival. I have heard reports three different days this week about men and women, young men, young women, older men, older women in this congregation who are going out and spreading the gospel. Not because we have some program, but because they can't help it. Woe is me if I preach not the word of God. And they're going in places and they're doing things and they're, they're reporting back, the Lord's doing this and the Lord's doing that. And we're going to start having some testimony videos about some of the stuff that God is doing that isn't in the context of, of a religious program, but rather the fire of God in men and women that needs a vent. 
Amen? Amen. And if you're sitting here and you're going, huh, that's not me, then ask the Lord to make it you. How do I do that? Well, start by repenting for it not being you. Repentance precedes revival. Repentance precedes revival. Letter A in your notes. And repentance comes with personal revelation, and now we're where we've camped for a while. Covenantal resolution. Daniel turned to the Lord, and we're going to get into identificational repentance. That's what the next 16 verses are, but we've been stopped at verse 3 for a while. Daniel turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and in ashes. He turned to the Lord because of the revelation of the word of the Lord and he began to agree with God. That's what amen means. When you say amen or amen at the end of a prayer, that is not an announcement, prayer is done. It is, I am agreeing. When I preach and you say in your seat, whether loudly or quietly, you say amen. It's not a go get them, pastor. Amen is I'm agreeing. My spirit agrees with what you're saying. My spirit agrees with the word of the Lord being declared. My spirit agrees with the prayer that is being offered. I am joining my spirit to your spirit. I am joining my faith to your faith. Amen. Amen. And so the power of agreement cannot be overstated. We talked about this. Jesus said in Matthew 18 that if two of you agree, just two of you agree as to touching any one thing, it shall be done by my Father. So the power of agreement has a disproportional power to it. Again, why the Lord is looking for a remnant. He doesn't need everybody. He just needs somebody. Deliverance comes through agreement. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. The word confess means to agree with, to come into covenant with. So, Justin, could you just flip that whiteboard around for me? Thank you. So we began talking about strongholds. And we've all pretty much are in agreement that our nation has several strongholds. Amen? Let me see some hands. Do we agree that our nation has some strongholds? How about, maybe that's too broad for you. How about our city? Okay? Thank, that's perfect. No, it doesn't have to be erased. Thank you, Justin. Let's give Justin a thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry I forgot to tell you earlier today. So, Strongholds within a nation are the consequences of strongholds within a community. They all hit, begin to hit critical mass. And strongholds within a community are born out of strongholds within families and people groups, which are born out of strongholds within individuals. Strongholds are harmful agreements. Remember I said earlier, I cannot overstate the power of agreement. That is for positive and negative. That is for good and for ill. And oftentimes we come into agreements with darkness. Paul called it in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. He said, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Everybody say demolish strongholds. That means to pulverize them. We demolish arguments and every pretension, verse 5, that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So we're breaking this down and we've been doing it. If our nation, I'll give you one of the strongholds in our nation, mammon. Mammon. 
okay? Don't get me wrong. We, money's, money's a great tool. It's a tool. When money becomes more than a tool in your life, it is an instrument of mammon. It's not to be a goal. Well, we need research. Yeah, we do. It's a tool. So we look for revenue and resource streams because we need the tool. Give me another example. This is a wonderful building. If the building becomes what is worshipped rather than a place of worship, it's out of order. Are you, are you tracking with me? Okay. So that's one of the, the strongholds in our nation. The problem is with mammon come all sorts of other things. People compromise everything for mammon. They compromise their personal purity. They compromise their personal integrity. They'll compromise and throw out relationships. They will kill and steal and destroy when mammon is a goal instead of a tool. Are you seeing where I'm going with this? As long as we keep it here, we get to blame somebody else for it. So when we keep it here, we can still kind of blame somebody else. Like in Oakland, well, we can blame the mayor. We can blame the city council. We, you know, it's those guys. But then when we start getting down here and here, we have to own our personal agreements that have been destructive in our lives. And they are a house of thoughts. Remember, we talked about the trichotomy all, you know, for quite a bit this year. So as a, as a Christian, we're saved. Our spirit is born again. Our flesh is corrupt. Our flesh is under the influence of the world. That's why it must always be subjugated to the spirit within us. The battleground is in the mind. And it is here in the mind that strongholds or houses of thoughts develop. Faith versus carnality. Strongholds are commanding, controlling, defining fortifications, heavily defended, high places that command things below. And so as we, we look at this and we take the mind here, I'm, I'm kind of blowing that up. We, we have strongholds that develop. It's when we come into, maybe it's a simple thought that comes into alliance with darkness. But left unchecked, the enemy, like a cancer, never just sits there. It grows and expands. And so suddenly that, and I use the illustration of a hut, suddenly this little grass hut starts to become this tower of destruction. This isolated place of thinking within our own life. Well, you're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You're not pretty enough. One of the entry-level lies of hell is rejection. The enemy uses rejection quickly and repeatedly. Often, you'll, you'll find it in teenagers when they first have any kind of romantic inclination and they experience that rejection. They carry that into their next and their next and their next. And finally, by the time they get married, they got this pallet full of junk that they're hauling around with them into every relationship and they don't even know. And they, they meet somebody that the Lord has designed for them. And they kind of do this. They kind of, kind of hide it, all this stuff, you know. Maybe you won't see. Because it's agreements with sin and agreements with woundedness and agreements with hurts and agreements with lies, but they're holding them around because they become patterns of behavior born out of illicit or untrue patterns of thought. Are you tracking with me? This is still review, but I, are, you, are you with me? Because I'm going to go somewhere today. Most of us in this room, and you that are watching online, thank you for, for, for being with us. Most of us, go ahead, Tom, and put that other uh, that pie chart up there. Mo most of us want faith, hope, and growth. That's why we're here. 
Okay, that's why you take time. That's why you, you'll do whatever you got to do to either listen to the word online or you that are coming into the church and you, you, you'll, you'll do whatever you need to do to, to try to exercise faith, experience hope, and grow. But we have these houses of thoughts, these agreements. They're very subtle. Remember, we talked about this a little bit. They don't look as ugly as they are. In fact, the enemy convinces us that we need those strongholds to protect us. Those fortifications are protecting us. We don't even realize that there are agreements we've made with our past woundedness and the enemy is saying to us, here, let me take what I did to you before and I'll show you how to protect you from what I did to you before. And we go, aha. Well, they did that to me, so that will never happen to me again. Have you ever made a statement like that? Whatever happened to thou, O oh Lord, art a shield about me. Psalm 3, 3. You're my glory. You are the lifter of my head. What about, well, I got to cheat just a little bit to get ahead in this business deal. Whatever happened to you, O oh Lord, are my provider. Well, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. It starts subtly. It starts easily. Are you ready for me to step on toes? I've often had people step on my feet before and I often tell them, don't worry, it's, I, I only use the bottom. So my intention here is not to harm you or trip you because you only use the bottom. But I want to step on a couple things. Not because I'm mad at you at all, but because I love you. So I'm going to step on things by, by sharing something from, from me. Rob and I were in a leadership thing yesterday in, in Fresno. Dr. Fred Garman, excellent stuff. I'd love all of you to go. And there's three more sessions in October, December, and January. But he spoke about, and I won't tell his story. I'll only tell his story to the place that it relates to what I want to share with you. He spoke about some of the tragedies in his own personal childhood and the comfort he found in a movie theater because it was a place of safety, a place of darkness, isolation, safety, and it, and it was much safer than what, was, what he was experiencing in his home as a child. Do you, under, you understand? The, okay, so I'll just leave it there. But then he talked about movie popcorn. And I laughed to myself and because I've actually told her this. I said, oh, there's no popcorn like movie popcorn. How many of you agree with that? Overpriced, overcaloried, overoiled, oversalted, glory to God. There is no popcorn like movie popcorn. And he shared something I did not know, and so now I will have to fight this particular stronghold because he shared that you don't have to go to the movies to get movie popcorn. You can actually stop at the theater, go in, and just get the popcorn. No one told me this. I love movie popcorn. Now, I only get, you know, a little bit now, but I still, I love it. And then I, then I got to, I, I was laughing and, and, and nudging her. And then, and then it dawned on me, oh, no. But here's the reality. Certain things become places of comfort. Because they comforted in a place of pain. Let me say that again. Certain things become a a, a system of comfort because they comforted in a place of pain. And isn't it ironic and isn't it tragic, rather, 
how many times we use things like food, alcohol, drugs, tobacco, bad relationships, because they brought us comfort in a place of pain. And so even when the acuteness of the pain is over with, we find a strange comfort in behavior that is actually harmful. Are you relating to what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Sometimes we get comforted by our sense of anger. Because we overcame a bully one day with our anger. And now everybody's a bully. Do you know what I'm talking about, guys, at least? And so what happens is the enemy is very tricky. He causes you pain. Then he brings you a comfort that fosters even more pain get you dependent upon the comfort so that even when the acuteness of the pain is gone, you're still destroying yourself. Anybody ever done that? Hands. Have you ever done that? And so here's what happens. Rather than going to the freeing one... We try to find keys to unlock chains where there are no real keys. What we find are keys that loosen the chains but don't unlock them. We find ways to cope that make the pain more tolerable but doesn't remove the chain. Paul told the Christians in Galatia, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge of my law, the prophet Hosea said. Jesus said, the prince of this world is coming, but he has no hold on me. Now, do you want friends who tell you what you want to hear? Or friends who will tell you what you need to hear? Do you want a God who will bless your mess or a God who will lift you out of your mess? Most of the American church wants a God that will bless their mess, tolerate their sin, and make them feel better about the wickedness that is destroying them. Loose their chains a little bit. Jesus has come to set men and women free. So you're saying, well, pastor, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and he's just not answered my prayer. Of course he's not going to answer that prayer. The prayer that says, make my mess okay, make my life tolerable, make my conditions all right to me so I can keep going in bondage but feel better about it. What kind of God would answer that kind of prayer? He's looking for agreement. And it's not where God agrees with you. It's where you agree with him. So that rejection that happened, maybe as a child and a dad abandoned you or a mom abandoned you. Maybe as a young teenager and your first quote-unquote love abandoned you or rejected you or betrayed you. Maybe as you've gone through life, you've experienced bigotry and prejudice and, and humiliation and, and indignity. And you've just decided that that's just the way it is and you're not going to have it anymore. Don't you understand? Don't you remember the old song? Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves all the little children of the world. Don't you know the opposite of that is true? Satan hates us all. He doesn't care if we're fighting each other. He doesn't care if we're, if we're saying this group or that group is evil and this group or that group is victims and this group or that group. He's happy with all of that. 
because he's in bondaging people by the multitude. But you have a savior. You have a redeemer. You have a king. You have a God. In John 14, 30, who said, the prince of this world is indeed coming, but he has no hold in me. And Jesus is wanting to step into your life, step into your mind, step into your spirit, step into your body, and come and bring deliverance and health and wholeness where you're not dependent on anything but him. That your sense of affirmation doesn't come because somebody whistles at you. Your sense of dignity doesn't come because someone who's always treated you with indignity suddenly starts treating you better. You have a place in God that no one can steal. You have a place in God that no one can take away. You are accepted in the beloved. You are cared for by heaven. You are honored by the king of the universe. You are cherished by the God of heaven. You are his apple of his eye. Even as I say that, the little whispers are going, ah, oh, no, not you. That's everybody else in here. That's a lie. Stop agreeing with the lie. That's where deliverance begins, is when you disagree with the lie and begin to agree with the truth. All right, here we are. How does God do this? We've talked about truth. Through Jesus and beginning with ourselves, how do we tear down these strongholds? A, truth. Everybody say truth. I had four people say truth. Let's try that again. Everybody say it loudly. Truth. Amen. Not opinion. It means no disrespect to lawyers but not some angle over here that you're saying over there so you can come back over here and change what you said over there. Truth. Truth. Truth is that which sets free. Why? Because you have to break agreements and come into new agreements. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus also said, I am the truth. He also said in John 17 as he prayed, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Set them apart for your purposes. Make them holy. How? Your word is truth, which is again what we've been harping on all summer. Have a reigniting of the word of God in your life. Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, 105, truth shining light guides me in my choices and decisions. The revelation of your word makes my pathway clear. So through Jesus, through his word, we tear down strongholds through truth. The first thing you have to do is expose the lie. It's the first thing. Have you ever almost ran into a car on the freeway because they were in your blind spot? Yeah. <laughs> Only a handful of you? You guys are a lot better drivers than me. I like the new cars. I don't have one, but when I rent one, the new cars have these all lights and mirrors and they, they light up when your car's in your blind spot and kind of warn you. Why? That's truth. Because I don't see it doesn't mean the car isn't there. And if I behave as if the car isn't there, I'm going to have a wreck. Truth is that mirror or that light or that warning signal that says, hold on, you've got a blind spot and there's something over here that's going to cause a cataclysmic wreck if you continue on this course of action. The word of God is that to us. The spirit of God is that to us. And the people of God are that to us. That's why sometimes we need a pastor, a counselor, a friend who loves us enough to speak truth. 
Let me say that again. Now, someone who speaks truth without loving me, I can't trust. Because they're just wanting to win an argument or make a point or they're dealing with their own affirmation issues. But someone who loves me, someone who give their life for me, someone who cares about who I am and where I'm going and where I've been, and when they speak truth, they're speaking truth in love, I, in wisdom, forget, forget moral decency, just in wisdom need to listen. Because the first way we begin to come into disagreement with darkness and agreement with light is truth. The second step is trust. Letter B, or point, bullet point B under, under letter A, I think. I lost track of my own notes. All right. Tom, put it up there. Trust. Trust. Yeah, it is letter B. Thank you. <laughs> we need truth to break these alliances, but we need trust that someone will speak truth to me. Let's look at this. Proverbs 3, we must first trust the Lord. Everybody say, I got to trust God. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen, listen, listen for God's voice in everything. In everything you do, everywhere you go, he's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God. You need him every day. You need him every hour. You need him every moment. You need to keep huts from getting sowed. You need to keep towers from being built. You need to keep moats from being dug. You need God to speak truth in your life. So trust him. Run to him. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the assurance of things you hope for. The absolute conviction that there are realities you've never seen. Blind spots and opportunities. Things you've never seen, God sees all. Romans 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith is to trust God. Hebrews 11.6, it's impossible to please God apart from faith. Why? Because anyone who wants to approach God must believe both that he exists and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. Oh, I don't know that God will respond to me. That is a house of thought. He cares enough to respond. It doesn't mean it's going to be a gigantic voice out of heaven. It could be your husband, your wife, your friend. It could be a word in the scripture that suddenly jumps out at you that you've never seen before. But faith says he cares enough to respond. So I expect God to respond. Do you understand that I, I've had to live this out for almost 40 years? I expect God to give me his word. For you. I expect that. I trust him for that. Where I fight is boy, movie popcorn is really good. <laughs> Where I fight is God's word for me. God's word for you, I'm expecting. God's word for me, I'm learning. Can anyone relate to that? That's what we're talking about. 2 Corinthians 3. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Everybody say freedom. freedom. Some trust in chariots, the psalmist said, and some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. Do you understand? I don't put my trust in men or women or institutions in and of themselves. I put my trust in God, but I also trust that God will bring men into my life that will speak his word to me. 
Proverbs 29, 5. Fear and intimidation is a trap that holds you back. But when you place your confidence in the Lord, you will be seated in the high place. Do you understand, my friends, that one of the greatest strongholds in the life of any person, not just the Christian faith, but in the life of any person, we preached about it the first part of the year, one of the greatest strongholds is the stronghold of fear. Fear is a liar. Fear is a trap. Fear is a destroyer. How do I break fear? Put my trust in God. He's not afraid of anything or anyone. Do you understand that COVID has never scared Jesus? Do you understand that what the government does or doesn't do or what money or economic systems do or do not do has not to one moment or iota frightened the Lord? Do you understand that the failing of the people of God does not frighten God? Why? He's got a way. He's got a remedy. So we've got to put truth. We've got to put trust. We've got to put trust in God. Now, this is where it gets tricky and this is where it gets hard. Everybody say this. Turn to your neighbor and say, this one's hard. The way God has set up his kingdom and his ministry, and I'm going, to, I'm going to wind this down here in a moment. The way that God has set this stuff up is that he uses people to heal people. Doesn't mean you don't ask questions. Doesn't mean you don't seek verification. But how many of you have ever taken a prescription pill from a doctor and you have no idea what's actually in that pill? Hands, please. Online, push a bunch of like buttons, okay, or something. Huh? I don't even know what they do. Right? I mean, have you ever taken and gone, I'm going to have this independently verified? No, you take it. You know what? In my left-hand pocket, every day of my life, generally speaking, there's going to be an Altoid. Okay? I don't know what's in this. All I know is it's hot and supposedly helps my, my throat and my, and, my, and my breath. But I don't know what's in it. I, I trust that they're not putting slow and low doses of arsenic in it. I don't know. How many of you have ever turned left in front of a car that had its left-hand signal on? You're putting crazy amount of trust in somebody else. I don't move till I see the tires going. Especially here. <laughs> we learn to trust implicitly on so many levels. But yet when it comes to levels of depth and of need... We isolate. My personality temperament goes there by default. I kind of go there. And then the enemy kind of uses that. But the word of God says I need truth and I have to trust God. But then it also says I have to trust the body of Christ. I have to trust somebody else. Not everybody else gets that place. But somebody else, maybe it's a minister, a pastor. One of our pastors here. Maybe it's a counselor, like Sister Rebecca and others like that. Maybe it's a true friend, the Bible says, who will stick closer than a brother. God doesn't need to raise up a hundred people in your life to help you get healthy. Remember, he likes remnants. He just will raise up maybe one, maybe two. Maybe your husband, maybe your wife, maybe your dad, maybe your mom, maybe your brother, maybe your sister. Maybe a, a friend that is a real friend who doesn't tell you just what you want to hear but what you need to hear, but does it with love. And maybe, as, as Maxwell said, with truth, timing, and tears. You say, well, that seems really weird. 
Well, I didn't make this up, okay? James 5, 16. In your notes and on the screen. Read it out loud with me. Because we don't like it very much. Everybody ready? One, two, three. Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Oh, how much I like that may be healed. Effectual fervent prayer. I always call Reverend Fierce for that. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We like those last two things. I like the healing. I like the effectual, effectual and fervent prayer. But I kind of skip over that first part. Do you remember what confess means? It means to agree. Confess your faults, not your wins. There's a place for confessing your wins. Don't get me wrong. But I didn't write this. The Word of God says, confess your faults one to another. Now again, does that mean we're going to have some big confession session? Nope. Are we going to become one big support group? Nope. But will we provide such things? Yes. Sister Rebecca and Dr. Rebecca are, are doing that with a grief share that's, that's starting throughout the fall. We have Bible studies. We have prayer meetings. We have these things. But this is a little deeper than that. To confess one's fault means that I've got to have someone, a person, a friend, someone that I can trust that God has brought this person into my life that I can, now watch this, agree to disagree. We like that phrase. And what it usually means is, you have your thought, I have my thought. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm saying is, get somebody in your life that will agree with you to disagree with what you've come into agreement with previously. You're still not tracking with me. You need somebody in your life. You say, Pastor, I don't have that person. Now you know what to pray for today. Someone in your life that loves you unconditionally. You say, well, they'd be shocked by all my, by all my faults. Probably not. You, they'd probably see him already. They're probably not shocked. Did you know I like movie theater popcorn? Really? Probably knew it. I'm using that as a silly thing. Let's put it more blunt. Do you know that sometimes I use food to comfort myself? Do you know sometimes I use vanity to hide my insecurity? Do you know sometimes I hide behind my education so that people will never know exactly how frightened I am? Are, am I stepping on toes? Yeah. Do you know sometimes I hide behind my, 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 my job that I'm so busy and I tell everybody I'm so busy and they know I'm so busy. That way I don't actually have to have a real relationship with anybody. Are we tracking yet? Amen. That sometimes I have to work so hard so that I can say to my, 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 my loved ones, oh, I, I, I wish I could be with you, but you know, I got to do this. You know what Jesus would say to that? You're just like the Pharisees who said, well, I'd help my mother and father, but because I've got to give this tax to the temple, I can't support them. You need someone in your life who will agree with you about the things that are destroying you and pray with you. Why is that so important? Because where two or three are gathered in my name in agreement 
if they'll touch any one thing in agreement, my Father will do this. Why? It is a holy vulnerability. It is an activity of faith. It is a releasing of pride. It is a, a, an acceptance of your own humanity and the fact that you haven't got it all together yet and you're not all there yet, but God has provided a resource so you and I can be free. Hallelujah. I don't trust everybody with everything. The Bible doesn't say that. Find trustworthy men. In fact, even the word of God itself, Paul told, Paul told the, the, those that were following him, find trustworthy men to leave this with. So this requires prayerful consideration. But go back, uh, John, or I mean, Tom, put that back up on the screen, please. James 5. Confess your faults one to another. Why? So you can be healed. As long as I'm playing games, do you know how many times people will say, uh, oh, pastor, I, I, I need this quote-unquote healing in my life. And they, and they identify the problem as they see it. But it's actually about the fifth step in the process. Four, three, two, and one. They don't even see Why do we confess? So that we can break these agreements that are causing the problems we do see by the hidden agendas of darkness that we don't see. So that we can be free. Galatians 6. My friends, if you see a believer who's overtaken with a fault, the one who is in the spirit should seek to restore him. How? In a spirit of gentleness. Turn to your neighbor and say, nobody's got it all together. Especially not you. No, don't say that. That's the point. Look what Paul keeps on. He continues. Keep watch over your own heart. So you won't be tempted to exalt yourself. Oh, well, they came to me for counseling. Okay. And who are you going to? They came to me for advice. Good. Who are you going to? Well, I gave the word of the Lord. Good. Who's giving you the word of the Lord? That's the way this works. Verse 2. Love empowers us. Everybody say empowered. So let me rephrase it. Say it this way. I am empowered. I am empowered. By the love of God. Love empowers us to fulfill the law of the anointed one as we carry each other's troubles. If you think you are somebody too important to stoop down to help another, when really you're not, you are living in deception. Ecclesiastes 4. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But here is the verse that identifies modern culture, not just in America, but maybe even around the world, although I can't speak to the Far East as well as I could the Western nations. But we are right here living this out. The last sentence, pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. You see, the illustration is we fall, maybe we fall into a ditch. Here's the culture. The culture says, oh, I'm going to jump in that ditch with you. And they do. And they grab you by the hand, and they do. But rather than having a way out of the ditch. They just walk you to another place in the ditch and act like they've helped you. And because we're so starved, we're so wounded, we're so needy, 
we think that the world's tools, gossip, drugs, alcohol, sex, pornography, anger, rage, we think the world's tools are helping us cope. No, they're just taking us down the ditch, probably deeper. Where Jesus says, yeah, go get in the ditch with your friend. But I'll pull you up. And we'll come out of that place together. But what happens sometimes, my friends, is we like the ditch. We like it. We got our TV over here, got our computer over there, got our fridge over here, got a couple friends who tell us how great we are over there, and if they won't tell us how great we are, we go get new friends. And we have a thousand people online who like everything we say. But I can't call one of them if I have a flat tire on the 880 at 3 in the morning. You see, Jesus is looking for authentic relationships in the church. Because he wants to restore authentic health to the world. And we've got to get in the ditch with each other, but not stay there. Care enough to look at him and go, yeah, all this stuff that you've set up in here that you like... We're not taking any of it. Because the guy we serve has really good new stuff for you. Well, how do I know? Well, that's where you got to trust. But we're going to come out of this together. Pity the man who falls and has no one to help them up. Here's what I trust about the Lord. He will not leave you abandoned. He has and is already preparing or has prepared someone in your life to help you and to help me. Now, we'll pray and we'll break, agree we'll break agreements with darkness because we have to and that's how it works. But I'm leading to letter C, which we'll talk about a little bit next week, and then we'll go into repentance. And that is the tenacity of this. How many of you have received prayer in the last two weeks and the Lord touched you? The Lord did something in your life, did something with a stronghold in your heart, in your mind. Okay? Now, same people. How many of you would say, but boy, the last two weeks, I've really had to lay hold of the promise. I've had to remind myself that I have been free and that I have broken that disagreement. And I've had to, to be tenacious about that. I want to see the same. Hand. Yeah, this is how it works. The Lord will do what only he can do. And then he teaches us to do what we must do. Are you tracking with me? So... My prayer is that we're free. So would you stand with me now? Everybody stand with me, please. Worship team, come on up.